Our lesson for this evening comes to us from Luke chapter 22, just one verse, verse 66. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together, and Jesus was led before them. So far the word. Did you notice something weird about this? Something, something strange here. You might have noticed this, this in the past, but if not, here's the thing. In the middle of, middle of the night, the Sanhedrin brought Jesus before them, right? And in the course of that time where Jesus was before them, they had come to the conclusion, yes, Jesus has committed blasphemy. And how did they know? Because they finally cornered him and they said, answer the question. Are you the Christ, the Son of God? And he answered, yes. And then you remember what the priest tears his robes. You've heard it. He committed blasphemy. He's worthy of death. And they all cast their votes against him, right? But any impartial, impartial observer, especially a Roman observer of this Jewish culture, would have looked at this and said, this man is not guilty of death. But you might say, wait a second, he called himself God. Give me a break. In Roman eyes, in Roman law, the only thing Caesar really cared about was what? You can call yourself God all day long, but you've got to pay the taxes. And what had Jesus done, right? He had held up the coin and said, whose inscription? Caesar's. Pay to Caesar what is Caesar's, right? Okay. Okay. And then comes our lesson. This is the strange part. At daybreak, the sun comes up and the council of the elders and the chief priests, teachers of the law, they all meet together. And Jesus now has a second trial? What's going on? Here it is. These men were very much consumed by the thought of maintaining some semblance of legality. And as we're going to look at this tonight, let's dig into, in this brief little sermon, a semblance of legality. Why? Why would the Sanhedrin want this? And we'll see what we learn about ourselves in the process. I'm going to give the uh, main point the main reason why the Sanhedrin had a second trial, because the first one was, and as you probably remember, the first one was illegal. It had to be a secret, right? And so here they were having their second trial, anxious to maintain the semblance of legality, and now they have the second one. Here's the thing. I'm going to give you an example from everyday life. Let's say a wife says to a husband, and I won't name any names, but let's say that wife says to the husband, at 3 o'clock, honey, at 3 o'clock, I want you to turn that slow cooker down to low. You got it? Yep, easy, got it. And I'm also going to give you a text message at like 5 minutes to, and then I'm also going to, you know what, I'll just give you a call as well, okay? I'll just give you a call. What's she doing? Very wise. She is making sure that it gets done and done right. She is covering all of her bases because she's learned. Right? Now, Sanhedrin, they were doing the same. They were covering all their bases. They were guys like, remember these names? Nicodemus, the night disciple, Joseph of Arimathea. People who were actually kind of sort of sympathetic to the whole Jesus thing. And actually listening to what Jesus had to say. They were covering all their bases, the Sanhedrin. They didn't want these guys showing up at the palace of the governor and saying, Oh, Pilate, by the way, they had an illegal meeting last night. We were sleeping and we didn't even know about it. You see the problem. You see why they were so concerned about a semblance of legality. Why they had the second one. But they might have also been afraid at the same time of the governor himself. What is he going to say? What's he going to do? Is he going to throw this out on a technicality? 
But they would be very happy to see and find out soon enough that their fears about the governor, Pontius, were very much unfounded. Pilate himself was more concerned about maintaining the semblance of legality than actually doing what was right. And that became obvious soon enough. Now this is the part where I'm going to get into guessing territory. I'm going to make an educated guess that there was another reason that they wanted to maintain this semblance of legality, and I could summarize it with one word. Noble. They wanted to appear as noble before the people, before their fellow Jewish people, especially in front of each other. They wanted to appear they're doing the right thing. And how, can, how exactly can you spin this as doing the right thing, though? Well, let me give you a, a trivial example. I'm going to give an old, old movie. This is the first of, like, four movies, I think. It was called Shrek. It came out some years ago. The bad guy in that movie, you don't have to know the story at all. It doesn't matter. Bad guy, Lord Farquaad. He was standing before a whole bunch of knights. They're going to go off to save the princess from the dragon. And he gives a speech to rally the troops. And he says to the knights, Now, it might very well be that many of you may lose your lives to save the princess from the dragon. But that is a sacrifice that I am willing to make. See it? How noble. Sanity. They were doing the same thing. In fact, they wanted to be more than just noble. They wanted to be seen as patriotic. Do you remember when God, Holy Spirit, chose, this is pretty rare, he chose to speak through what we presume to be an unbeliever, Caiaphas? And Caiaphas made a prophecy. He said, it's better if one man died and the whole nation perish. The epitome of patriotism. It's better that one American die than the whole United States of America and its people die. How patriotic. Do you see why they wanted a semblance of legality? The rules. They were doing it by the book. But the rules had become a justification for a lack of love. Think about the simplest of parables that Jesus gave. He gave more than one on this, but remember the Good Samaritan? The Levite, Levites, the priests, they see a guy literally bleeding out of the side of the road, and they pass by, but the good news of that parable is they showed up to work on time at the temple. Yay! How noble. How punctual. They were doing their jobs. Now, you might say the Sanhedrin and what they were about to do to Jesus, that is a much more extreme example of guys doing the wrong thing but trying to look noble and patriotic. And that is why Jesus said about them, and they were about to fulfill these words in spades, he said to them on Tuesday of Holy Week, you people, the leadership, you are so good at straining at gnats, and yet you swallow, remember, Camels, whole. Kind of a gross imagery, right? Disgusting, but you understand. Seeing the forest for the trees. We have those kind of phrases in English. Same exact thing. And here is where, right after Jesus said that, so quickly, they gave ammo. They gave Jesus ammunition for the truth of his words. They proved it. When they came to the steps of the governor, Caesar's representative, and they got to the palace, and you know what they did? Th this would scare me. I'd be scared to do this. They told the governor, hey, yeah, you soldiers, go ahead and, uh, uh, you servants, go ahead and tell the governor to come out to us. We'll wait. Remember why they said that? Because it was the Passover, and they didn't want to become unclean by going into a Gentile's house, however grand the palace might be. Straining at gnats and swallowing camels whole. Lynching the Son of God after thousands of miracles and so much preaching, even seeing the miracles face to face with Jesus, and yet lynching the Son of God. How, how does it come to this for any human being? And why do human beings do this? 
They do something that, you know what, in the back of their head, they know, they know. And yet they want to appear noble. Why? I'll give you one reason. I hope this is extremely easy to understand. Here we go. Because it's so much easier. Now follow me on this. Having a semblance of legality, doing something that appears holy part-time in one part of your life is so much easier than God laying down his law. What a burden that thing is, right? Speaking from my sinful nature, what a burden the commands of God are. Where he says, you have to follow it all the time. From beginning to end of your life. That sounds exhausting, doesn't it? Exhausting. A semblance of legality is so much easier. But true followers of the way, the way, they don't do things by the book. Now, you hear me say that, you might say, wait, wait, what? Did you just say, Pastor, they don't do things by the book? But Jesus himself was a by-the-book guy. Right? He said, and I think this was Pastor Helwig's sermon, I will keep the Passover. That's doing it by the book. And if you look at the ministry of Jesus Christ, he did every single thing by the law, by the book. So when I say true Christianity is not about doing things by the book, what I mean is it's not about doing it just only by the book. Because what did the book require? Well, you could give the example right towards the end of Jesus' ministry. In the Garden of Gethsemane, I think this is pretty safe. I'm not going out on a limb when I say this. Jesus did not murder anybody in the Garden of Gethsemane, even though people came to arrest him, right? God's commands say, do not murder. Jesus did it. Good job, Jesus. You kept the book. But then, Jesus picked up what? And he took that organ, bleeding, and he put it on the side of a man's head, and the creator began to recreate nervous tissue, blood, skin, to the point where you would never know that he had lost his ear, good as new, the creator did not just follow the book. He loved the man who had come to arrest him. You see the difference. Truth is about love for my neighbor. This is where it gets uncomfortable because this is about us. Truth is not just about doing it by the book. Rather, I should say, it is about love for my neighbor as well. Truth considers not just the letter of the law, but the intended purpose of the law. Because let's be real here. Anybody who is not really a follower of the way, the truth, they don't care about the letter of the law, and they don't care about the spirit. All they care about is taking a law and twisting it to their own purposes to make themselves look good. If we're honest with ourselves, we have to admit, by nature, we love this semblance of legality thing. And don't think pastors are above this. My goodness, no, do not think that. Do you know what? If I don't maintain a semblance of holiness, of legality, I can lose my job. Now you might say that's true, kind of true of every job, but is it not true? It's more true of being a pastor. If you don't maintain a semblance of holiness, there goes your job. I'm putting it in a crude way. But just to make it clear, right? A semblance of legality for yourself. Don't you sense that natural professional inside you who, in front of other people, oh, we're at church, we're at church, okay? I'm going to be best behavior, right? So that people assume that when I'm not in the public eye, I'm above board as well. And people do this. It works. They think you're just as good in private life as you are in public. It works. And we know that the semblance of legality can fool others into thinking that we are something more than what we necessarily are by nature. But God's no fool. 
God saw this little scripted dog and pony trick show for what it was. It had no semblance of legality when they tried the Son of God, and it was sin. And God sees our sin too. And he knows if we have done things by the book. And he even knows, I hate this part because it gets so detailed, he even knows when our attitudes do not conform to a right, holy action. Let's be real, right? I like to say this. When you do a right, good thing, a good work, has our attitudes ever been 100%? Never, not once in our entire life. That's what Jesus is saying. And let me tell you, God knows our sin, but he knows Jesus as well. God the Father knows Jesus so well that he actually sees us through the lens of Jesus Christ. That is a miracle that please don't ever ask me to fully explain, but that is Jesus showing by the book legality and then taking it to the next level on a cross. The only reason we are here tonight is because Jesus did not do things by the book. He went beyond. And he loved. Until it killed him. Because he has done this for us, we don't need to worry anymore. Be liberated. Listen to this. Be free. You don't have to worry about a semblance of legality. If you do good work at work, at church, with your family, as a husband or wife, as a son or a daughter, as you do that good work, you're not doing it for them. You aren't. The more mature you become in the faith, the more you are doing it simply. His love shown to me. And now I love you right back, Lord, and I even love the people around me. Even when they tick me off, yeah. Even when they tick me off. So since Jesus has given us more, the semblance of legality, are you kidding me? We have genuine, real, full-time holiness from Jesus Christ. So we can, we can strive for something higher, better. We can. Strive for an obedience, following the commands of God, Please rise. May that peace of God, which goes so far beyond our human understanding, may guard your hearts, your sanity, your very soul through faith in the Christ. Amen. I now invite